I had the privilege of talking with you today about technique and artistry. And those words are powerful, uh, they're familiar to you. Of course, technique, we're talking about touch, and artistry is sound. So our objective with our students is to make this intimate connection between touch and sound, technique and artistry. And as we know from our technique and artistry books at Piano Avengers, we always tie that sense of technique with the outcome, with the expressive outcome. So we're not working in, in technique in isolation, but always wiring the technique to the ear. Very powerful. In fact, we might say that there's a power in technique and artistry. Certainly, the expressivity of artistry is powerful, and all of us who attended the Fleischer Masterclass had a very good dose of artistry and that power. But I'm sometimes reminded that with our students, they don't care about artistry. That's something we need to nurture, but it's not front and center for them. So over the long developmental process, we nurture their sensitivity to artistry. But to the student, often there is a power of the technique. There's a certain showmanship, if you will. You know, as a teenager, who can just sit down and knock off a little riff. You know, it has that power to play what they hear, to express a riff, or in the literature. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say this is really heavily in skills. 
it's, it's not that there isn't conceptual understanding of technique. If we could get a little philosophical and say, could we have competence without comprehension? And sometimes we do. Sometimes we get these fluke of the kids with great coordination, and they're playing well, and they're demonstrating great competence, and never have to reflect on it. But that's the hope and a prayer method, right? And that lets 99% of our kids fall away because of lack of competence, due to lack of comprehension. So if we can fully comprehend the concepts of technique, but then work on making those routines that the students can hold that have automatized, then we have real skill. So let's break this down a little bit. What's going on in the mind as we learn concepts as in contrast to skills? We might say that conceptual learning deals with the process of cognition. There's the comparing and matching, finding similarities and differences. All those elements of pattern recognition that we so often talk about. I like to stress that visual pattern recognition, but more importantly, auditory pattern recognition. And then there's kinesthetic pattern recognition. So those are the conceptual learning. But on the skills end, it's motor routines. And motor, of course, is dealing with the neurology of the firing of the neurons to the muscles. It's not about muscle building, remember. We're not into the muscles here, but we're into the neurology. We're actually in the central nervous system, in the brain, right in here, we've got these little piano areas, or piano brains, or finger brains. And it can create a lot of brain space there as we train and develop these motor routines. So what about expertise? If this is the mental activity, how can we define or influence the expertise of uh, skill development and cognition? Well, here's the parallels. As we develop cognitive expertise, we are chunking patterns, aren't we? In other words, we have a mental efficiency by not having to think of every detail, but we have clusters of details together, as in the math and algebra equations or so on, that we can see things in clumps in chunks, if you will. A G7 chord, we don't have to think G up the third, B, D, F, that's four bits of information. We know G7, and when we see those notes anywhere scattered, we know it's G7, and one chunk of information. In fact, if we wanted to add the A flat on it, we kind of know, oh, that's the flat at nine, right? We know C minor, we know our scale, we go three flats, and of course our five is G that would include that A flat. That way, maybe two chunks of information for that whole concept of the dominant with the flat and nine. So we're accumulating chunks. Chunking is the process. And its counterpart in skills is automation. Not automation, we don't have to worry about robots, it's automation. And that's taking the motor routines and having them so well learned that we can replay them without conscious effort. So we're developing technique skill by automatizing motor routines. So let's dig into that a little bit, and let's look at what are we automatizing? What are we automatizing? We can't automatize the entire repertoire. So it's not just memorizing piece after piece and note after note after note with high figures and slow practice. We want to find and motor and uh, automatize patterns. In fact, I'd like to suggest that we automatize gestures. Gestures shouldn't feel too new, if you've been following our technique in artistry books, what are the technique secrets all about? That's the development of gestures. Sometimes it's bigger gestures, sometimes it's a component part of the gesture, but it's sequential. So we get the component parts, automatize it, build on that, automatize another gesture, and soon we have a set of powerful tools for virtuoso expression. Level one technique in artistry, you'll be we call a wrist float off where we work on repetition to automatize that upward motion of the wrist, right? Where we carry the weight away. It carries uh, with a slur gesture to preparation. Many, many aspects will work with that. We have woodpecker taps for lightening the wrist just to be able to have a delicate tapping, tapping on the tree or its counterpart if you were doing something in, at a higher level. We'd have a, a motion through the repetition. So you can see how building blocks of one gesture leads to more sophistication of the gesture at a higher level. Here we have the heavy arms, the technique secret being arm weight. We've had that in primer, we revisit here at the late elementary. So we have a counterpart of dropping with arm weight, and then we have the release of the arm weight with the wrist float on. Well, if we start putting those in a package gesture, 
that we see here with our Hayter's breast stroke, we can drop in with our arm weight and let that transfer and then the wrist float off carries us off again. So we get this wonderful grace and again a larger gesture built on the automatized routines of earlier gestures. Moving into the intermediate area, here's the up touch. In contrast to a drop touch of the arm weight, we can stay right on the surface of the key and take an impulse with the shoulder forward of the elbow here, back muscles, and pop right out of the keys for beautiful soft control or for very powerful loud sounds. They make a wonderful contrast, don't they, to a uh, down motion of an arm weight. Here we go up and down. So we get expressivity that comes out of these gestures. And if we move to level four, you have this one in your pack, and I thought we'd take just a few moments on the level four technique secrets because these help one understand the earlier secrets. In other words, those earlier secrets are prerequisites to what we have here. And the first one is alignment. Alignment sounds like a big name. Would we use that word alignment with our young kids at the earlier levels? We don't want to bog them down into the conceptual theory. We just want them to play well. So if we're, if we're automatizing the gestures, we're getting what we want. But keep the focus on listening, building the gestures. At an intermediate level, we can start to get to some terminology. So alignment, we're saying that we want the arm to be in a straight line over the wrist, aligned with that big base knuckle here, which rides over the finger. And if we do that, what do we have with the arm weight? The arm weight can transfer right in a ripple finger to finger. But if we were to do something like this, playing figure four, then it doesn't carry the arm weight, does it? Because I've got a big L here. And then what, what's the solution often? Well, the teachers might say, well, let's exercise figure four and build more muscle. But you get in a real mess that way, because generally what that's doing is accumulating tensions. And if anything, it's giving tremendous inefficiency in the plan. So this exercise, uh, we wrote it with the grace notes. So we have this very rapid motion to the principal note. And we don't stay with those grace notes. You move through them into a balancing over that principal note. I'm going to give you a close-up here because it's, you know, it's hard to see the keyboard from where you are. The balance beam exercise carries us through directly into this principal note on finger three, and then finger four, and then finger five. And notice how high I am on that finger five. I find that actually you almost always have to hold the student's hand underneath and help them find that spot where there'll be a collapse. It's, I wouldn't dare say it's unnatural, it's just that it's difficult to find without guidance. But if you can guide your student on that, you develop a wonderful control here, which is so you know, useful to voice in your chords, to voice the top, and you can have this powerful figures four and five then, without having a lot of muscle. It has to do with the structure and the alignment. But let's take a look at this again, just for another one. So instead, we're gonna drive right on through, aligning with the final note. In that process, pay attention to the thumb. What's likely to happen with the thumb, it'll probably hold the tension. So as you arrive in the principal note and you're checking your structure, sometimes I do a little wiggle. In some of our earlier drafts, we talked about jello, but I don't know if people even know about jello anymore, so we pull that out. But when you arrive in that principal note, relax the thumb. Consciously relax the thumb. You'll see that referenced in a number of our secrets at the earlier levels to take the tension out of the thumb because that's our grip. We want to get rid of the gripping response and learn to play the piano, not to hold. See, Jesus. <laughs> Some of the applications of these secrets, of course, are going to be inner artistry pieces. Just a quick little look at the page uh, four and five for some of the other secrets. Tonal colors, notice the secret is weighted tone and empty fingers. Now, I'm not a huge advocate of talking about empty fingers for the kids early on, because we want to get them to use arm weight and the less arm weight. But at this level, we can actually explore taking that arm weight almost fully away to have a good pianissimo. And by adding arm weight or subtracting arm weight, we can get some beautiful control of dynamics. Not just the terrace dynamics of my mezzo forte or piano, but we can actually give expressivity to the smaller modus by adding and subtracting that arm weight in the process of the gesture. And as you play your figurations, remember we're constantly closing the hand to let that hand align. 
So there's a wonderful synergy, if you will, between the arm weight and the alignment at this level. And some of those earlier technique secrets, such as um, even you know, making O's, where we're bringing our thumbs together, that's a closing the hand, isn't it? If you really did that on a key and you let go of your thumb, you find yourself in alignment. So you might want to find a little trick like that or two, where the level three B secret of closed hand, closing the hand for scale passage. So instead of this open hand, we keep it tight and closed as you move through passages, because that way we align over the note that plays. The uh, half circles and full circles there for secret four. We have this nice drop in here, and then to the relative minor. And these big leaps don't feel big at all under the hand with it, because we take it in a circular motion. And we're building then these half circles on what we've done at earlier levels of the full circle. So uh, under and over. So as we did those one octave arpeggios, notice I'm constantly closing the hand through the circle, which distributes the arm weight in alignment over the finger that plays. Now, I know this, sometimes it seems like, oh, this must be college stuff. Well, indeed, it is college stuff. It's doctoral DMA material. The student has never had it. It's a good time to get it. And a lot of them, you know, it's just not taught always, but it needs to be there. But it's a real disservice if we wait till after somebody's DMA to be teaching this, and when we're not giving it to them when they're seven and eight. Because if they're seven and eight, what are we automatizing if they learn these techniques and gestures early? We're automatizing virtuoso gestures. What happens if we don't teach it to them? Then they get the thousands of hours of automatizing bad playing, bad habits, inappropriate gestures. Just as we can automatize good, appropriate virtuoso fundamentals, we can automatize tension. We can automatize finger whacking, pushing on the bottom of the key, banging on the keys. Okay, we'll talk a little more as we go at that, what the neurology does. It can be both invigorating and keep us optimistic about what we can do, but it also can be scary about what a mess one can make of the nervous system. Uh, something like Snowy River, this is our, uh, you know, a technique artistry piece here out of the level 3D. <laughs> And that's what um, I, the intent here of the hand in favor. 
In fact, let's take a look here at this instrument. Anybody recognize it? This is an 1873 Broadwood. It's photo. It's in our institute, and it's a Beethoven vintage. It's actually exactly the same uh, model that Chopin played on his last concert when he played in London. And the action on this, the hammers are very small, lightweight. The action is about half of the key weight as a modern gram, one half. Now, what's significant about 1873? Coincidentally, that's the date that Hannon's exercises were published. Okay, let's think about that a minute. So, no wonder Hannon can write all his prefects about play from the beginning and go all the way through, but forget that on the modern grand. Don't do it. You're just going to make a mess. Okay? There are exercises in the Hannon book that I do not recommend you have anybody ever touch because they're too tangled. No matter how much you want to untangle it, they don't develop it. All they do is impose potential tensions. So part of doing this addition, then, is to find what is the gesture for which we can make this technique of the hand and exercise really effective? How can we automatize correct gestures using these exercises? So first off, I get rid of a lot, right? Someone we don't want to touch. Which ones are powerful? And then let's work with them to make them transformative. So if you look at the title here, it's not the virtuoso pianist now, but it's the new virtuoso pianist because we're adapting it to the modern grand. We're going to use our, we're going to use alignment, we're going to use our wrist circles and rotation. So it's with transformative warm-ups. So part of it is not canon. We have to have these exercises that help build the skills to be able to do this canon well. So I've added a lot of warm-ups to help that sense of developing gesture and virtuosity. This is another highlight of that we're transformative. We're going to make changes, right? We don't just say practice. We're going to guide very specifically. We're going to wire these motor routines and we're going to automatize these gestures. So we have a very specific purpose here. We're going to change the student's technique. We're going to develop coordination, not guesswork. We're going to take them through the curriculum. So we start in the book with three gestures and I wrote these to isolate what are the fundamental motions, not just for the Canon, but something that can be very applicable throughout the repertoire. The concept is pretty simple. Gesture one is the motion from finger one to five. Gesture two is fingers five to one. And gesture three is the turning in corner. How do we round the corner? So let's take a look at each. Gesture one, I call it the figure one to five swoop. So what we do is here is we have this half circle. Remember our circles? We're going to take that under swoop of the half circle, and in fact, if we're moving from one to five, we're going to trace that circle like this. And in here, I'm putting, it, I'm putting an accent on that five. As we saw in our alignment exercise, if the student's ready for it, we can really pop off of that, walking in here as we come through, and walk to that tall finger five. There's fabulous development. But if the student's younger and hasn't yet worked, through the earlier technique secrets and doesn't have a nice graceful motion as I just played out, then take it slowly and take it elegantly as if it's Mozart. Forget the accents and shape it. And then after we automatize that, or at least got that practice, then you can start adding the accent and more speed and more sense of impulse. Let's take a look closer. And you can take it first without the accent. If you'd like to do that wrist float off at the end and shape it softly. So what we have here is there's a dropping of arm weight, isn't there? And then there's the uh, walking out where I'm coming a little away from the keys. And then with the last fingers, we're walking back in and out as if we're going to carry the circle around the corner. So it's a very elegant feel, and we're going to use that with lots of repetitions. Stay with these three gestures before we get into the rest of the book. Just work on them a while, and then you move into the exercises of the book. So gesture two, then, is coming over the top of the wrist circle. So what fingers would that deal with? That's starting on the five and moving to the thumb. So we have this tracing here of over the top. And notice what's happening with the thumb. I'm coming like this on the thumb. And importantly, it's not just over the circle, but I'm walking in with each consecutive finger. There's that walk in to the thumb. I sometimes talk about the can opener and the thumb for the kids. But someone pointed out to me that they don't know what a can opener is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look closer. The arm, and we're rippling that arm weight over 
over top, closing the hand as we go. So we can do it elegantly with a slur gesture and a nice phrase off first, and then in subsequent weeks, once that's mastered, then we can take it with an impulse and the accent on the last note. Can we look at gesture three? What if we play the scale and we go to the top, right? We're going up, and then we have to change direction. Well, what happens at the top? Well, there has to be this extremely rapid uh, de deceleration, and then there's a stop when you turn the other way. Well, what happens if you have a stop in any piano playing? Any stop is going to force a muscle against a muscle. You have to put the brakes on, and then brakes are going to induce the tension. So instead, we want to make that circle, because we can do these elliptical motions. We talk about playing the piano. Really, the essence of stepping artistry is arcs, isn't it? Which is why we do the rainbows with little kids at my first piano adventures. Cover that all with a stone on the mountain exercise. If you haven't seen it, we start developing that sense of gesture early, early on. So around the corner here, turning the corner and then changing directions means we're going to drop in and walk around. So we're coming around that outside of the circle, if you will. Very elegant little drop in a curve. And it's done with an active finger that walks in and draws us over around the corner. Let's take a close up. Drop and round the corner. So I have a downward motion of the arm weight. And then here, coming around, and I begin to walk in and float off at the end. OK, now, we talked about this itemization. Let's get into it just a little bit more. What's the process? What's going on? Are we, on, are we automatizing in the fingers? Are we automatizing in the muscle? Sometimes we talk, people talk about muscle memory, but what's interesting here is we're not really reprogramming the muscles, we're reprogramming the brain. Because it's not the peripheral nervous system out here where we're developing this extreme skill. It's the coordinations that are actually in the skull, in the brain, that wire them to those muscles. So we have to learn how to relax certain muscles while others are being instantaneously fired and actuated. So the process really here of Moving from these motor routines to an automatized routine is the process of myelination. The root word here is myelin. Myelin is this fatty tissue. It's a lipid, which is kind of fat, you might say. It's 80% actually fat and 20% protein. So uh, when you're going through your graduate school, you be conscious of a vegetarian or a vegan diet, you need to have your fats and your oils and your proteins to myelinate the nervous system. The it's a myelin sheet, so it's a wrapping of the nerves. So what we have then is the axon of the nerve. We're going to find that whatever, this is in cognition as well as motor skills, it's something that's done over and over with repetition. And where the, the nerve is fired often, it's a trigger to certain of the neurochemicals in the brain to have these oligodendrocytes shoot out these little tentacles, and they go find the new, that nerve that's being activated and they kind of shoot a little bit of gooey stuff. I don't know what's called the tongue, or where that goo meets the axon from underneath. And with repetition, we get more of that, almost soaked around it in loops and wraps. It can be a weak wrapping, or it can be a thick wrapping. Isn't that interesting? It's like an insulator. And if it's insulated, it's going to mean it doesn't have interference from other things. So it's very resilient. And it means you can find it right away. You don't have to think about it, because if it's a myelinated nerve, we, our mind can go right to it and activate it. That's why the automization works, because we don't have to think about it. It's myelinated. It's right there. And it doesn't go away. It's not it's unmyelinated. It does deteriorate a little bit. But there is a little dendrocytes that untangle it. So there's nothing that reworks to untangle a bad habit. You have to build a new neuron that's more myelinated than the bad habit. That's why under pressure, what happens? So you revert to that old bad habit. So, Let's get it right from the start. It behooves us to understand this and to guide the students to correct play. So a little more on the myelin. There's a little anecdotal uh, study which I like. A giant squid. But how do you compare a giant squid's nerve that's unmyelinated to a human's well-myelinated axon? Guess how much faster the myelination is of a human? 5,000 times faster. So what that myelin does is not only make it reliable, but it induces the speed of the induction through that neural circuitry is hundreds of times faster. 
And maybe it's unfair to compare the squid to the human brain. But even in our human brain, a relatively unmyelinated axon compared to a heavily myelinated axon can be about 500 times faster. So no wonder we can get really good speed and really we have tremendous potential for competence. So let's remember then the root on this is that the skill and the automization here derives from repetition. Because without repetition, the myelination isn't going to happen. We can go a little farther. We can say that if you impose a challenge with intense concentration, that helps activate these neurochemicals in the cells that contribute to the myelination. So don't be afraid of challenges. Just make sure the repetition is done right. Don't challenge somebody into repeating, repeating what's done wrong. Because then we're doing improper myelination. We run into trouble. So appropriate challenge is doing what the student can do well many times to repeat it. It takes about five hours of repetition before that myelination process can start to be seen uh, with image scan. Okay, so we, we have it, this process that we're going to be doing the repetition, that myelin becomes more and more thick skin, if you will. And that's giving us that automatized skin. Let's take a look at the table of contents on the hand. We've established these initial gestures with our territory exercise. And if we look at the table, first of all, we look through here. These are the original numbering. And I gave that for a reference because sometimes we get to know these well. And I wanted to not, uh, not have it be confusing if you've been accustomed to the old sequence. But the human sequence just isn't that effective. So I resequenced them to focus on the central gestures and which exercises contribute to that gesture. So set one are circles. This is dealing with our list circles, which tie right into what we've been looking at in technique and artistry. And then we move into the rotation. And we'll look at that in a little bit. This is a forearm motion. And then we mix circles and rotation in the pattern. Set four is closing the hand, where we need to take away notes as the hand gets smaller. And then set five is the opening the hand, which is a little bit of a misnomer in a way, because how do we handle opening the hand? whether it be here or opening the hand for extensions in level three technique and artistry. Well, we handle opening the hand by closing the hand, right? We want to always close the hand to take out the tension. So we have to shoot it open and move through that opening so it closes as we go, just as we saw in the alignment exercise. If you get rid of the old notes, all that matters is the future. Stay out of the path, okay? So, and then finally the advanced step, which come out of the part two. So our first one, that we all know, exercise number one, and gave these little titles just to help us out a little bit. So three dimensions and no tensions. So what do we have here? Well, let's analyze it, not by jumping in with both hands, because that's going to make a mess. Let's go to the previous page, and this is the value that's so powerful is working through these preps, because the preps are going to give us the absolutely correct gesture, which then can be repeated hands alone, and then eventually hands together. So we have this motion here. Notice I've got a full circle, but by taking out some of those intermediary notes, we can accentuate this motion much more. We get the sense of, oh yeah, I'm feeling that two here, and I'm feeling my pull over with five. Let's take a close up. Close up. Hands. We're going to take a complete wrist circle here by dropping under and then the over the top. So I'm pulling out slightly here and then walking in with each consecutive finger here. And you can see how well this builds on the gestures that we've been preparing so that the student can get his layering their knowledge, building on prerequisite skills. Left hand prep.
So we focus and we concentrate, but what's the ultimate goal for automation? Yeah, have it done without concentration, right? So you can play around these as you do the gestures and you work with these and you come back and review them. You can start training the student to practice it with concentration and then practice it without any thinking at all. And can we just have that just rattle right out while you're having a conversation or whatever? Because we don't want to be thinking about the emotions when we're playing. We want to be listening, adjusting to the piano, and, and be focused on the expression. So our hands together then here, because our gesture is in parallel motion, hands together, but our hands are contrary motion, we're going to have this kind of funny situation going. Can you see what I have? In other words, one hand swooping under while the other's over. It's going to feel a little funny, like a, I don't know, playing with a fish or something. We were making a joke, we came out of the restaurant last night, and you know that roundabout? Did you go by the roundabout? So we came out of a restaurant with a revolving door. And coming through the revolving door, we're going counterclockwise, and then we had to go to the roundabout, and we had to go clockwise. And it just made me think of business. <laughs> but remember, we're automatizing these skills, so it's not going to be hard. And the more we've done our preps, the more we led up to it, it's just pulling out the automatized skill anyway. So it's going to work, work well. And sometimes it's just that orientation that can be a little difficult. Let's take a look. I'm going to swoop under with my right hand while I'm going over the top with the left. And so on. Uh, so have fun with that. Let's look at a few of the others because uh, we all know one really well, but how do we deal with some of these more intricate ones? If we take a look at number three, the prep for three, we're going to see that the exercise number three on page what is it, 17 we had this little trill for so. The general problem is students will muscle up on that sound. It doesn't sound good, does it? So we don't want to accent multiple beats. We flow each drum or close two, but it doesn't go get twice. So we drop in, and that second thumb has to be light. So the exercise to prep is thumb and then over. So we do this very light thumb. To notice the whole exercise is still transcribed as a circle. So we put it together. Let's take a close up. Staccato thumbs. Now all the notes. Notice how finger five is active, it carries us around the corner. Sometimes I talk about that with his kids. I'll say, okay, we're going to hook on together. And get very good, very good practice. Just grab active five and walks in here is the circle. I've touched on uh, some of the rotation ones. If we go to number four, you may remember that Hannon has the exercise of uh, this one with seconds he puts first, but then later comes back uh, to the exercise that goes the bigger leaves. And with obviously the larger leaf in rotation is going to be easier to execute. So we put, I put number, uh, this exercise here, the number six from hand first, so we can feel that rotation of the wider leaf, and then we follow it with rotated seconds, which are a little more difficult to execute. Let's get a close up right here first of our preps. So, uh, by the way, on these preps, notice the left is on the left hand, right? And the right hand's on the right page. But that doesn't mean you can't start with the right hand prep. I like to tell students often if they're right handed, take the hand that works easiest, master it there, and then let that hand teach and mirror image the other hand. But if you start in the hard hand, it's really hard to execute it correctly. Start in the easier hand, get a model out of it, and then say, let that hand teach your other hand. I'm going to fall back this way. Now I'm going to rotate towards the accent of notes. Rotate. Fall back. So when we go back to our... And so what? And then taking our hands together. Vitality. And that, that rhythm and that vitality. 
algorithm is really very helpful in establishing powerful gesture optimization as well. But I'm going to give another caveat about rhythm. When we're doing especially hands together, you feel like you have to put the metronome on and click through all of these and staying with the rhythm at all costs. What happens with that is sometimes when we find a tension, we go flying right through it. We keep repeating it. So I like to do, if I'm practicing something like this, I may go more like a... Some of these, like this prep here, notice for, for number eight, we have this forte, the rotation, then big gesture, fast gesture, then soft. So when you're going to hands together playing of the same, because they don't have that one here, we're going to do a, we can put it for bottom. Follow the accents and the fermatas that we have in the warm-ups when you do hands together. You'll find it to be very, very beneficial. Some of these, this comes from the extending the hand, really powerful exercise there with that staccato in the left hand going into the uh, tenor voice, and we're transcribing our circle through. This is an important one. In opening the hand, notice that staccato, we get rid of that note right away. So we can just fly right off the open. It doesn't feel like the hand's open at all. The hand feels closed the entire day of time, even with your hands together. We talked about this mirror image of the circles. When you're doing rotation, you don't have to worry about that. So what happens in rotation, both hands can do it in parallel, so we don't have this alternate conflict of the circles. And finally, at the end, we get into some of the advanced ones, a little longer, a lot of fun here, actually. This one is just a highlight of the slow prep. We have this quick circle and then a big, long, yeah, circle, quick circle. So put it together. Knows A and E and A and E and knows it 
whole. So notice that leading cone is the G sharp. Then we transpose it to C, then you move it to the triple of this G, D. And by the time you get to the book, boy, well, you've got somebody that knows these keys really well. Uh, some chord progressions added in, this kind of bio chord progression of one, seven, six, five, right? Let's take that in all keys. This is really powerful stuff. And in the last section of the book, the book's worth it just for this, because this fundamental chord progression. So understanding what I'm calling now the primary chord is denominated in uh, the six chord to join the one chord and five. Okay? So it's one chord and five and six because the pop songs, hip hop these days, all love this progression of one, five, six, four. So we're going to learn that along with the 1960s, one, six, four, five, and we're going to play it in all keys and we're going to work through chord accompaniment patterns with that. Or how about this one here? Take this little exercise, three, four, five, so the one chord, but the third in the bass, four, five, and one. Then you get to happy birthday, and you say, ah, look at that, three, four, five. We understand that fundamental harmony. So it's just one, two, five, seven, five, seven, and one. And what's next? Ah, third in the bass, one, stepping up to four, to five, and one. And notice the chart. Ah, all 12 keys. Everybody can do that, but isn't that tremendous? You don't have to get the postgraduate work to learn happy birthday anymore. You <laughs> can do that at age seven and eight. And they love it. They love the transpositions, but it takes that little extra challenge, a little extra work. But you can skip around. You don't have to be doing C sharp and G sharp minor. You choose which ones are appropriate. And then I'd like to ask the student, I say, well, should we do a hard one? Why don't you choose a really hard one? See what you can do. They're going to dig in, stretch the mind a little bit, and dig in to have a favorite difficult key. That's a good way to go. So here we're then working with this cognition of chunking. It's a tool, high leverage tool for chunking, just as the favorite hands and technique secrets are high leverage automatizing. I wanted to share with you uh, one other book in your pack, and I know we'll be wrapping up here very shortly, but uh, we've been done, doing a lot of work for the adults. You've probably seen our new adult book one and two with the online support, a couple hours of video, and our pop books and classics. We've Flush those out now to have classics too. All, all new pieces, all new arrangements. First, we're going to be lazy. We're going to pick up out of big time, the big time classics. And Nancy says, no, no. And I said, yeah, just pick up out of <laughs> Nancy says, no, we're going to do it all new. So we got a whole new set of songs for this you know, big eight page book or whatever of new classical arrangements. And on the pop, a lot of good stuff here. Uh, just fun stuff. Uh, Adele rolling in the deep here. We all know the song with Carlos Santana. It's a lot of fun. We get this. Uh... <laughs> Combine our videos. 
that it just makes it all the more powerful. And of course, with Nancy's fabulous model teaching videos as well. So we're very excited to be <coughs> providing those services for you and to just to be a greater resource uh, for you. Okay? Great. Let's close with just a little bit of fun. Uh, we can take a piano and, you know, I mentioned our player app, if you haven't explored that. I'm just going to hit a play button. This is a little preview of what's to come. Uh, this being just a little dance electronica version of uh, Canon One. You know, Randy, I, I want to take this as a teachable moment to say that, you know, we often just sit down at a bench and it was way too low. And I thought, even though we're just going to play Hannah, Hannah number one with the Hannah Philharmonic, right. you take the time to set yourself up properly on your bench. Yeah, that's why you need to do All right, I think it goes. Great, thank you. Let's see what we've got here.